I'm telling you, it was like getting hit in the head with a ton of bricks. Our derby career could have easily ended then and there. All right, well, welcome back to Champion's Journey. On this episode, we're gonna take you back to the origins of how our family got started with the sport of soapbox. And uh, before we do that though, Ronan, why don't you tell us a little about this car? Um, so this is the first car I ever raced in. Uh, as you can see, it's a stock car. And it's also the first car that me and my uh, dad ever built. Um, this is one of my favorite cars because we've had a lot of memories with this thing. And um, uh, just racing it down uh, the track in my first local that I ever raced in. And it's just a really good car. Yeah, I raced it for about four years. And uh, we're going to tell you that story about the first local, but before we do that, we're going to go way back to, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the spark that ignited my interest in Soapbox Derby and the local conditions that kind of made that possible. So come on along. Hey, if you like what you're seeing here, please hit subscribe, ring the bell to be notified of new videos, give us a thumbs up, and share with your friends. I grew up in the Seattle, Washington area, home to Boeing, Microsoft, Amazon, and a hotbed for inventive, industrious families. In other words, an ideal environment for Derby to flourish. Thanks to the Seattle Times newspaper, coincidentally my earliest employer, our town got on board in the very first year of National Soapbox Derby Competition, 1934. For the first decade or so, cars raced each year down a steep hill near the Times offices right in downtown Seattle. Along with his counterpart from Portland, Oregon, our first local champion, 13-year-old Vernon Nagel, traveled to Akron to represent the Great Pacific Northwest. Nagel traveled 2,400 miles to the All-American, only to be eliminated in round one. Following World War II, races continued in the Seattle area through the 1940s and 50s. By the early 60s, the jet age had taken full flight, and interest in soapbox derby flourished. Organizations in both Seattle and nearby Tacoma invested in permanent tracks and the competition this helped spark produced an outstanding group of racers from Washington State. In 1964, Greg Schumacher from Tacoma became our first ever All-American World Champion. This was followed two years later by David Crusoe and his sleek blue and gold racer. Both of these spectacular cars are now on display at the Derby Downs Hall of Fame in Akron. Racing continued into the 1970s in our area, but like many parts of the country, following the loss of Chevrolet's sponsorship, and in turn the newspapers they employed, interest had begun to wane. By the late 1970s, the Woodland Park track in North Seattle was in need of serious repair. In 1978, the Pacific Northwest Soapbox Derby Association was formed, and a small group of dedicated individuals, including Paul Gale and Homer Burroughs, helped restore the Seattle track eventually hosting multiple AASBD and NDR events each year. This intense period of derby interest produced the only other NDR national champion from Washington State besides our son Ronan. Both Heidi Burris and her twin sister Dini put together six outstanding years in derby, racing in both the junior and senior divisions. They qualified for both the All-American and NDR championships over multiple years. Heidi became NDR national champion in the senior division at the 1981 NDR in Allentown, Pennsylvania. This was incidentally the first major race to use a timer swap format. The car and axle mount designs that their dad Homer created in the early 1980s still inform new designs to this day. Coincidentally, both Homer and I have had careers as Boeing engineers. Around the same time, I was in the fourth grade on summer vacation walking through the park with a group of friends. Our path took us up this strangely striped and gated steep strip of concrete and a passerby told us it was a soapbox derby track. I simply could not get that idea out of my head and upon seeing a TV show featuring these cars, I hightailed it to the internet of our day, the public library. After a bit of research, I returned home armed with several books about how to build a derby car. Unfortunately, I didn't have easy access to the official wheels or axles, but undeterred, I recall buying what I could at the local hardware store with my paper route money and getting right to work out in the garage. 
I distinctly recall learning how to use our saber saw to cut out a floorboard and creating a fairly functional drag type brake assembly. Alas, I lacked the support system at the time to get the car race ready, but I recall hours of fun reading and tinkering, and I'd say the hook was set. Okay, now let's fast forward 30 years. There's been a lot of derby racing around Washington during this period in towns like Polsbo, Spokane, Mount Vernon, Olympia, Everett, and Vancouver. Allison and I are happily married with two young kids living 90 minutes north of Seattle near the town of Stanwood. I'm employed as an aerospace engineer and we're busy trying to finish up a house we built over the prior two years. Ten years later, the house is still not entirely complete, but that's a derby story for another day. One day while in town, we happened upon the poster shown here. Wow, a soapbox derby right in our backyard. We just had to check it out. This was the third year Stanwood was running an all-American local on a very fast street track. We'd no sooner walked up on the finish line area when a fast-moving car caught a cone and jumped the curb right in front of us. Everyone was A-OK, -okay, but the excitement this generated made quite an impression upon our family. Rona and I were all in to build one of these speedy cars for the following year, while our daughter Willa, on the other hand, was a definite no-go for the time being. All right, well, so that winter, um, a late arrival from Santa, brought a bright red stock car kit and a kid's toolbox. And uh, we were off and running. Uh, and it was pretty cold out in the garage, the unheated garage, so we did what any sensible derby family would do. We built it in our dining room where we now have a table. At the time we had sawhorses, you remember that? And uh, I, being an engineer with a bit of a geek, I uh, got us some Legos and we put a car together out of Legos and we tested it on a ramp. Remember we were doing that? And we, we tried to figure out what the best weight distribution would be just working on a ramp with Legos. Um, started a notebook here to keep track of our research. Still have all kinds of stuff in here from gathered over the years and a few other notebooks bigger than this. Um, started to work on it. Uh, we. I wanted to trick it out, so we put a um, uh, seat cast out of lead, and I thought it would be neat to have it shaped like a butt shape, like a tra farmer's tractor, which is probably pretty comfortable, but it got a lot of compliments and attention, but in hindsight, it actually pushed Ronan's body forward in the car into a very unaerodynamic position, so it was not a secret to, uh, not a good speed secret. Um, but anyway, we, we got the car and we were off and running. Being a vintage racing net, I suggested a livery based on a 1950s Ferrari that raced in the legendary La Carrera Panamericana race, which runs across Mexico each year. Friends and family really started to take notice as we poured hours and then many weeks into prep for the big race held each June over Father's Day weekend. Ronan and I burned the midnight oil and did everything we could to field the finest car we were capable of. We also researched the track, practiced driving, and started a notebook to organize our data and strategies. I have to admit, given my background in engineering and all our research and prep, we were feeling highly confident going in. Now you have to understand, Stanwood truly is a derby town. At that time, we were drawing 70 car fields and that number is now approaching 100. Prior to the big race, businesses fly checkered flags, the Lions Club raises a neon derby car on the old smokestack, and the local paper runs color features on the front page. Race day is huge, drawing many hundreds of spectators with a parade and the Boy Scouts selling hamburgers. Well, Ronan, what do you remember from that first big race? Um, I don't remember much from it, but I remember there's like lots of crowds and uh... When I first got on the ramps, I was super nervous because from the car's point of view, it looked, uh, it looked super steep. And I'd never been down it before. And halfway through the race, it started pouring down rain, so the track was really wet. And I was a participant that day, I didn't place. That's really all I know. Yeah, you we're pretty young. Um, I remember you were driving really well. Um, I remember you were putting it on the lines I asked you to, even though I was basically telling you to put it on the wrong lines because I didn't understand that you had a different line when it rained than when it was dry. Um, 
I do remember not only did we lose, but we got double phased in one of the two races, but we were two, two race, two heats and we were done. Um, about as bad as you can possibly do. <laughs> um, I remember coming back to the awning afterwards and, um, and just wanting to crawl under a rock and die basically. And there were, there were family and friends asking what happened and I was not in a mood really to talk about it. Um, it was like having uh, a ton of bricks dumped on on our head really and uh, uh, I can remember even a week later uh, feeling sick to my stomach when I would think about it. I just felt like we really dropped the ball. Um, it would have been very easy at that point to give up and quit um, but we didn't. Nope. We, uh, we kind of regrouped and we um, rolled up our sleeves and went and started to learn what we needed to learn. We learned about alignment, cross bind, we learned about the right weight distribution, the kind of lines to drive in different conditions. Um, big thing was we started rallying, um, which is where you really learn how to drive these cars. Um, we, um, just lots of practice. Uh, it took three more years in stock I remember on the next year you were doing really well um, and you were taking it outside but you had to go all the way to the outside on this track right next to the cones that, that were blocking the storm drains and we were telling your own you don't need to be right on them but but you were trying to get every bit you could and you caught one and what happened there uh, uh, yeah I just caught one and crashed the car I was done racing it was it was spectacular. You were up on the sidewalk. You hit a tire cone into a tire, launched you, slid down the sidewalk. The ends of both axles were ground to 45 degree angles when we got the car back, and you ended up in a tire. And you were pretty shaken up, but but the car did its job. You were you were good, um, but we were done. The car was no way was that car running again. Um, the next year you were again doing well. Um, and uh, and what happened there was raining that year. Uh, that year, um, it had been pouring down rain all day long, and the finish line, or after the finish line, the braking zone, it was too wet with the cars. You had to really slam on the brakes to stop. And I was I was stopping, but uh, the handler down at the bottom, the fuel cone under my car, and I got long stop after the very beginning the last year. And I was done so both years you ended up wrecking the car completely in sixth place yeah. coincidentally both years right it, which is in a field of over 30 cars that's pretty good um, but but we kept at it and then finally in year four 2014 last year of eligibility in stock when you were 13 years old you finally got her done and uh, and then you, you you doubled down the next year uh, by winning the same race in Superstock to become the first back-to-back -back winner in Stanwood. So it's a pretty good end of the story. Um, we have a, a souvenir, Ronan, that you might not have seen in a little while here. Um, grab that out of, out of there. The very first trophy from the very first race, 2011. Yeah, it's a little smaller than the uh, five big ones behind us here, but um, but it probably means an awful lot because it kind of represents our journey, which has been almost 10 years long to get to where we're at. So um, it's kind of, I think you've told me before, it's your favorite trophy. Yeah. And I don't blame you one bit. So anyway, uh, next time I, we, we took a little break here. I didn't uh, do the shop video I was going to do. We're working on that right now. Um, and we'll take you out in the shop on, on the next one and start working on the cars a little bit. So thanks for joining us. See you guys. All right, welcome back to Champion's Journey. In this episode, we're gonna take you back to the, I don't even remember what I'm supposed to say now. <laughs>